Okay. All right. So kids, I'll say this. If you've got to be in here with us, this is a great day to be in here with us because this morning's text has been a long time coming. Because as you know, everybody, from chapters 4 through 18, this book... Oh, I didn't pray, did I? Lord knows we need to pray. Let's pray for this text. So Father, we thank you for today, and we do thank you for all the things that you're doing um, with us, Lord, and through us. And we do pray, most importantly, Lord, that you would bless this time even now that we've set aside uh, for us to look at your word, Lord. We pray that you would be our teacher today. We pray that you'd give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to your church. And we ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if you've been with us as we've been going through this book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, from the beginning, you know that chapters 4 through 18, so the lion's share of the book, have dealt primarily with the events of that seven-year coming tribulation period. We've seen the actions of Satan. We've seen the judgments of God. We've seen the reactions of men on earth. And yet now beginning in chapter 19, uh, we're going to see a very noticeable change in terms of the narrative because the great tribulation is coming to an end on earth and the spotlight is going to shift once again to focus back on heaven. So this morning is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And you remember that last week we finished off another one of those kind of strange parenthetical passages. Remember that chapter 17 and 18 introduced us to this thing called Babylon, right? The great harlot, right? The, the kind of typifies that wicked world system that draws people away from the worship of the true and living God. Remember in chapter 17, we saw specifically the destruction of the religious aspect of that system, the coming destruction of religious Babylon. And then last week when we looked at chapter 18, it detailed for us the destruction of commercial Babylon, right? Representative of the, the whole global economic system very much in place today, even more so in place during that coming tribulation period, all of the abundance and the luxury that's so intoxicating to our flesh. And what a price the world has paid for these two ungodly systems, right? Through the years at the expense of the kingdom of God and at the expense of the people of God as religion and consumerism have taken that place in human lives that rightly only belongs to God. And God doesn't like it. And we saw these last two weeks that he is going to one day judge it. And as we left off last week, you remember that when he does judge it, the reaction here on earth is going to be one of weeping and of mourning. And you remember that the kings wept and the merchants wept and the sailors wept, all of them weeping over the destruction of this system which had profited them personally so much. But then we also saw when we last left off, I think in our, just our last verse last week, there was a completely different reaction that came from heaven. And we're going to see that that reaction carries right over into our text this morning. It starts out with these alleluias of joy in heaven. So why is heaven rejoicing? Well, we're going to see three reasons just in the first ten verses. And the first of those is that heaven is rejoicing because sin has finally been judged. It says in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 19, John writes that after these things... So after the destruction of commercial and uh, religious Babylon, he says, after these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again, they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. 
Right, so if you've been with us the last few weeks, you guessed it, this is a mega voice, right, from this mega multitude. This kind of explosion of praise that comes from heaven at the destruction of these two systems, right? The destruction of the mega harlot. Because she has been the one that's corrupted the whole world and drawn them away into her adulterous sin. And yet what we see is that for all of her riches, for all of her allure, there was nothing left of her at this point but smoke. And notice that heaven is praising God not just for the fact that she's been destroyed, not simply because he has avenged the blood of his servants, but notice that we're going to praise him also, as we see in verse 2, because true and righteous are his judgments. Once again, God's judgments, as we have, as we've seen as we've worked our way through this entire book and we've looked at them, they are not random. They are not emotional, they are very measured, and they are deliberate, and they are righteous, and they are true, and they are perfect. And the the fact is that God could not, he would not be righteous himself if he didn't judge the unrighteousness in such a righteous way. And again, I think this reminds us, I think it's very important to be reminded of this fact that when God calls us as Christians to leave the vengeance to him, that we can leave the vengeance to him. Okay, and what I mean, so Paul wrote to the church at Rome, he said this, he said, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now, some of you might have that crossed out in your Bibles. Because when we read this, we can sometimes read this particular passage, and all we see is, don't do anything about it, right? Leave it to God. And we think, ah, rats, you know? I wanted to get right in there and get, you know, get some vengeance. And the reason that we get frustrated is because we don't see the promise that's associated with this prohibition. When God says, I will repay, he will repay. You know, the, the one thing about God repaying the world or God repaying an individual for their wickedness, the one thing about God taking vengeance out upon the world is that he will never overstep himself. What happens when you and I try to take vengeance into our own hands is we can so easily become so emotional. We can be very fleshly in the way that we exact that pound of flesh, right? We can end up doing things then that are worse than the thing that was done to us. And then we live the rest of our lives sort of regretting that vengeance that we've taken. And the point is, we should just leave all of that to God. God is going to avenge the injustice done to his people for simply being righteous and for simply being faithful to him all through the ages. Even that person that is troubling you right this morning, that person that you're struggling with, that person that seems to be the thorn in your side, leave that with him because he is Righteous, And so we have this whole heavenly multitude singing these hallelujah choruses. Now, that Greek word hallelujah is just the, the Greek form of the Hebrew hallelujah, right? It means praise Jehovah or praise the Lord. It's a very familiar Old Testament word. And what I think is interesting is that that word is only used four times in all of the New Testament each one of them in this very chapter. As we rejoice over the destruction of this evil, wicked system that has plagued the world, that's stolen the hearts and stolen the minds and stolen the soul and strength of people away from God. And we see that all of heaven is going to sing these praises. Now, notice all of heaven, including the 24 elders, which we've talked about, is representative of the entire company of redeemed believers, right? Old Testament and New Testament saints, as well as those four living creatures. Remember, we met them back in verse uh, chapter 4. They're representative of what? The entire creation. 
right? So you've got all of the redeemed out of the human race. You've got all of creation. Truly, this is a great multitude. And I love that phrase. I love those three words, a great multitude. And I think it's worth making at least a mental note of those words in our mind because sometimes people can think that heaven is going to maybe have like a hundred people standing around in it, right? Like maybe it's all of Calvary Mountain View plus a few people that got saved years ago at a Billy Graham crusade, right? And that's going to be anybody that makes it. But the truth is there is going to be a great multitude there in heaven and each and every one of us is a testimony to the saving work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are each a testimony to the work of all those through the ages who love the Lord and who serve the Lord all across this planet and the fact that every day God is working to reach every single person with the gospel. The, the gospel? We're going to reach every person and we're going to put them in the gospel. We want to reach every person with the gospel. And he's doing a very good job of it. God is doing a good job of getting the gospel out and of saving people, although you would never know it, right? It's never going to make the headlines. It's never going to get any traction in the media. But he is doing it each and every day. And there is going to be this huge multitude in heaven as a testimony to it. Other places in the scripture tell us that it's going to be an innumerable number, right? We can't even number the number of people that are going to be there. It's hundreds of millions and then millions of millions on top of those hundreds and millions. And let me tell you one thing, you are going to want to be there. And if you're here this morning and you haven't trusted in Jesus as your savior yet, you need to do that so you can be a part of this great number. And for the rest of you, you all better be working on your alleluias, right? And you better be learning the lyrics that are in these verses. And if you get up there and you don't know the words to the song, please don't tell them you came from Calvary Chapel Mountain View. <laughs> tell them you came from Calvary Chapel, the first, congreg the first congregational church of me, myself, and I, right? That's where you came from if you get up there and you don't know the words. So here's heaven rejoicing, right? Sin has been judged and also next because it says in verses 5 and 6, it's because God is reigning. It says in verse 5 that then a voice came from the throne saying, praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. So here we are, right? This great multitude with all of our voices together in this Niagara Falls kind of a thunderous roar, praising God for his omnipotence, right? big theological word which simply means that he is all powerful. So this is heaven here saying thank you Lord that you're the one who's omnipotent and not man. Right? Imagine what if God wasn't all powerful? What if it was man who was all powerful? And what if God had no power to bring this wickedness and this rebellion to an end? I mean, that would be a pretty dismal prospect, wouldn't it? You know, as we look around, you know, you look around, you read a paper, you scroll through your news feed, you flip on the, the, the cable news if you can stand it. And at any given moment, right, there are multiple examples on this planet of nations and kingdoms that are fighting within themselves, where they are struggling just to hold things together because of this internal strife. You've got internal fighting and you've got warlords, you've got drug gangs, you've got armed militias, you've got rogue militaries, not to mention apocalyptic religious extremists who are seizing control of entire countries. Right? You have nations all around the world who for all of the power and all of the wealth of their government, they are borderline able to fight off 
these kinds of powerful insurgent groups just within their own countries. And so if you look at things and you understand, wow, if God wasn't able, if God didn't have the power to bring these things to an end, we would just continue to devolve into chaos. And yet we know that the Lord does have the power. He is going to step in and he is going to bring an end to these things before everything takes over. Just take a message for me. Tell them I will get right back to them in about an hour and a half. So his power is going to have the final say in human history. That's something to praise him for. Amen. That's something to praise him for, not just when we get to heaven, but right here and now. Now, here's what I think is interesting. At the end of verse six there. The literal translation of that final phrase is that the Lord God omnipotent has begun to reign. So God has been reigning on the throne of heaven, but now he is about to conquer the thrones of earth. As well as the kingdom of Satan, as well as this coming kingdom of the beast. And in his sovereignty, we are watching him as he allows men and evil angels to do their worst. But finally, there will come a time here in Revelation chapter 19 where God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Just as we have been praying and the church has been praying for centuries. And sometimes I think we can wonder... Personally, we look at some of these things that we go through. We look at some of the things that come into our lives and we can have a tendency to question his omnipotence, right? How could this thing have been allowed to happen to us? And yet this is where we need to trust in him. This is where we need that to, to trust that some way, somehow, it fulfills his purpose for us. If God is all powerful, if he is omnipotent, if he has allowed something into your life, trust that he has done it for your good and for his glory. And so we should simply praise him for it. When things are bad, we praise him for it. When tragedy strikes, we can praise him for it because we know that he loves us because he demonstrated his love for us on the cross. So, so far, in just six verses, heaven has rejoiced because sin has been judged. Heaven has rejoiced because God is reigning. And now finally, starting off in verse seven, it says, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. So one more reason why we, with this great multitude, are so filled with God's praise and filled with joy is because the time has come for the Lamb of God to be joined unto his people. To be joined unto us in an intimate union that is so close that it can only be compared to the marriage of a man and a woman. And though this certainly appears to have seemed to John, maybe it appears to us like it's too good to be true. Look at the way that the angel affirms at the end of that. He says, look, these are the true sayings of God. I'm not lying here, John. This is going to happen. Now, we've seen, we've talked about the fact that this idea of the relationship between God and his people as a marriage goes back far into the Old Testament. Again and again, we see the prophets picturing Israel as the chosen wife of God, and more specifically during times in their history, as the wayward wife of God, whose promised restoration will come in this future kingdom. And then we've seen this same kind of a marriage symbolism runs all through right into the New Testament. And yet the church, not regarded as some sort of an unfaithful wife, but as what? As a virgin bride. 
right, as we await the coming of our heavenly bridegroom. And this, by the way, is one of the reasons why there's such great importance placed upon the sanctity of that marriage relationship, because it's a picture of our permanent relationship with Jesus Christ. And the picture here of this marriage and of this wedding feast, I can tell you this would have meant so much to John's original Jewish reader audience. Now, understand that Jewish weddings in that day were very different than our weddings today in the Western world. First of all, there would have been an engagement years and years before called a betrothal. And the betrothal was arranged by the parents. How's that sound, youth group? I think it sounds really good at this point with three daughters, right? The betrothal arranged by the parents, they didn't leave that to the whims and the wants of the youth, right? When they were very young, the bride and the groom would have been promised to one another. The engagement was binding and it could not be broken except by a special form of divorce. Now, finally, when they were old enough and the marriage was to be consummated, the groom would return for his bride, and yet the exact time of the groom's arrival was never known to her in advance. But instead, he would come and he would whisk her away from her home, and then the bride and the groom would remain hidden at the groom's father's house for seven days. At the end of seven days, the bride and the groom could emerge together for what would be this multi-day marriage supper feast. Now, Bible students, well-taught church here at Calvary Chapel Mountain View, I pray that this picture is perfectly clear to you, right? We, the church, have been betrothed to Jesus, right? The dowry has been paid for us. The arrangements have already been made. All that we are waiting for at this point is for our bridegroom Jesus to return for us at a time that we do not know and then whisk us away to his father's house. What's that sound like? The rapture of the church where we will be safely secluded away with him for seven days or the seven days years of this tribulation period, after which we will emerge with him and be presented with him as his wife as we enjoy this heavenly marriage supper, right? The marriage supper of the Lamb. This is such a beautifully perfect prophetic picture, or it's just a lucky coincidence, amen? Or not, right? We have such a wonderful future with our bridegroom to look forward to. But I want us to notice this. What does it say for now that we are supposed to be doing while we wait? Look again at the end of verse 7. It says, his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So that's right, we are getting ready. Right? We are putting on fine linen, clean and bright, right? We're totally tracking with all of that, especially me, because I look pretty good, I think, in white, so I've been told. But what's this business? What's this business at the end about the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints, right? You're thinking, well, Pastor Bill, I thought you keep saying that we're saved by grace and not by works, right? Not by our righteous acts. Well, and indeed we are. Nobody can work their way to heaven, and the Bible is perfectly clear on this point. Remember the Apostle Paul writing to the Ephesians, he said, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and not that of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Our salvation is a free gift that God gives and we simply receive. Our righteous acts cannot save us. In fact, the Bible teaches that the very best that you and I can do when we are at our best Again, Isaiah 64 says all of that stuff, all of our righteousnesses are filthy rags. So we cannot make ourselves worthy of heaven. 
And yet, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, then his righteousness, which is a perfect righteousness, it's put to our account, right? It's imputed to us. And it's kind of an accounting term that's often used in the Bible, that the righteousness of Jesus is credited to our account. And what that means is that now, every time God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin. He sees the righteousness of his son. And yet this is where this whole fine linen and this wedding gown becoming the righteous acts of the saints comes in. Because once we are saved, now we start to obey the Lord out of a love for him and all that he's done for us. And as we walk in obedience to him, then those righteous deeds that we do do are now being stored up and that will be what makes up our wedding gown at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Think about it in this way. It's very similar to that old tradition of a young bride's hope chest. Right, where young girls begin at a very young age, they're given this special chest and they place and they store up special items over the years for their wedding and for their marriage. Maybe they're you know, a special nightgown or, or household treasures or linens. Again, we're not saved by our works, but the Bible makes it clear that we are storing up treasures even now for ourselves. And so in light of that, Ask yourself this question, what kind of a dress will I be wearing at the marriage supper of the Lamb? It's kind of a sobering thought, isn't it? It's kind of an interesting way to look at obeying the Lord, isn't it? That every time we obey him, as we walk with him, what we're doing is just doing a little bit more finishing work on our wedding gown. And I know some of you in here, and you have such beautiful testimonies, I know that there are going to be some of you in here that are going to have some beautiful gowns in heaven. I will probably be there in a miniskirt, I'm afraid, at some time. Right. How's that for a visual on a Sunday morning? Okay, back to our text. This scene, right, is so impressive to John, all the he, hearing these alleluias and this truth of the marriage, right, to our Savior. So sure were these promises. Look what happens next in verse 10. It says in verse 10, and I fell at his feet to worship him. This is the angel. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. John is so overwhelmed by everything that he's experiencing and all these things that he is hearing, he can't help himself and he falls down at the feet of this angel and he starts to worship. But understand, it wasn't because John didn't know any better. At this point, remember, John's like 90 years old. It's amazing he could fall at anybody's feet, right? 90 years old, and he is probably as saintly as any person could possibly be. He knows better than to worship angels, but he does it. He does it because he's just got to fall down and give praise and give thanks and express that overflowing that's happening in his heart. And I think that this is a great reminder for us that heaven is going to be better than we could ever possibly even imagine that it is possibly ever even going to be. It's going to be better than that. And the reason it's going to be better is because our Savior Jesus will be the focus. And that's why the angel so quickly redirects John's, right? He redirects John's focus. He puts it back on Jesus where it needs to be because both in heaven and on earth, it is all about Jesus, right? He is the subject of the story. You've heard the expression that history is his story. And I love, hate this next 
uh, illustration, right? Years ago, there was a publishing company who brought together this panel of about 30 educators and historians. And they asked this panel to select what would be the 100 most significant events in history and then to rank them in order of importance. And so they took months to consider and then the panel reported that they considered the most significant event of history to be the discovery of America. I think they were probably American historians, right? Second place, most important event in the history of the world was the invention of movable type by Gutenberg. The third, 11 different events tied for third place and five events tied for fourth place. The writing of the Constitution of the United States, the development of ether, Somebody tell me why that's so important, right? The development of the X-ray, the discovery of the airplane, and also tied for fourth place is the life of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus tied for fourth. And what a sad commentary, isn't it, on the condition of our humanity, right? The human race that our savior the son of the living God, God himself come to earth in the flesh to redeem sinful mankind that he tied for fourth place. We know he's not fourth, amen, he's first. And what the angel says here is that all of the scriptures from the in the beginning God of Genesis 1-1 right through the you know, the grace and of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen, of Revelation 22, 21, every verse in between testifies to that fact. It testifies, it's the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the intent behind every prophecy that God has given in his word, Old Testament and New Testament, is to testify to Jesus. It's to glorify him. We've talked about the fact before that this book of Revelation, it's not the revelation of facts about the future. It's not the revelation of something that will lead us into a knowledge of prophecy and just knowing all of these things. The revelation of Jesus Christ is to lead us into a greater worship of Jesus so that we truly start to see him more fully for who he is. I love what one author wrote about this Subject. He said that this means that prophecy at its very heart is designed to unfold the beauty and loveliness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So if prophecy doesn't draw me into a closer relationship with the Lord Jesus, then I have missed the purpose of prophecy and of the word of God. You remember when Jesus spoke to the Jewish religious leaders in John chapter 5, he said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. So what the religious leaders of the day were doing is they were looking entirely at the law and the prophets and they were saying, okay, God gave us all of this so that we might figure out how to live lives that are good enough to get into heaven because we've established our own righteousness before God. And what Jesus said in essence is that is not at all why these words were given to you. Jesus said, you have missed the entire meaning of the Old Testament. Because the entire purpose of the law and the prophets is to speak of Jesus the Messiah who would eventually come, right? From the entire sacrificial system to every kind of offering in the temple, to the temple and the tabernacle itself, all of the design, all of the furnishings, from the, the things inside the Holy of Holies on the inside, all the way to the badger skins on the outside, right? Every single thing about all of those things, they are all pictures of Jesus and they all point to him. Remember on the, uh, the road to Emmaus, Jesus walked with the two disciples after his resurrection and it says that beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He, he said that one of the functions of the Holy Spirit 
is to glorify him, right? And to, to tell us the things that will come. And so we see these first 10 verses of this chapter. It's this tremendous, beautiful revelation, right? It's a very fitting introduction to what we are about to see in the very next verse. Now we come to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Verse 11 is the entire subject of this book. It says in verse 11, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Again, make a note next to verse 11 because this is the climax of everything that we have read so far. It's like this giant curtain just opened up to reveal the greatest masterpiece you could imagine. Heaven itself is opening now to reveal Jesus Christ, but this time in all of his glory. Because he is coming now to finally judge and to make things right. It says he's going to wage war against the wickedness and the rebellion upon the earth. Do you remember back in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 4, remember everybody's all kind of lifted up in pride. They're kind of drunk with the charisma of the Antichrist and all of the false promises that he made. And remember they said this of him. They said, who is like the beast? Right? Who is able to make war with him? Well, here's their answer to that question. And I promise you the end is not going to be as good as they wanted it to be. Jesus is coming just as he promised that he would because he is faithful and true. He's always faithful. He's always true. And now he's going to fulfill all of the promises and fulfill all of the prophecies related to him in the establishing of his righteous kingdom. He's going to fulfill all of the prophecies that he didn't yet fulfill in his first coming. Did you know that Bible students have found as many as 574 verses in the Old Testament alone that somehow point to or describe or reference the work of the coming Messiah? And we know conservatively that Jesus easily fulfilled at least 300, if not 350 of those prophecies in his first coming. So any of the ones that he missed... Right? He only missed because they were always intended to be fulfilled at his second coming, and he will do it. Because he's faithful and true to his word. This is the whole reason why those same religious leaders of Jesus' day missed the Messiah. They understood the part about the conquering king, and yet they completely missed the part about the suffering servant. And so when he didn't come conquering at his first coming, they dismissed him entirely because they just couldn't see it or they wouldn't see it. And I think for each of us this morning, there may be promises from the Lord Jesus through his word in your life this morning that still seem to be unfulfilled. And you're waiting, right? And you can't figure out how he possibly could fulfill them all, but he will. And this verse reminds us of that glorious fact. And let me encourage you with this too. It is not your job to figure out how he's going to fulfill all those yet to be fulfilled promises. Your job is simply to trust in him that he will do it. And then to recognize when he does do it and then to praise him that he did it. You could start praising him now because you know he's going to do it. And remember this. Remember that his work in the world was so great that it is going to take two separate comings for all of those promises to be fulfilled. And so it may well take multiple visits to your life personally to fulfill all of those promises that he's made to you specifically. But he is faithful and he is true. 
and as we continue now in the text, look at the way that John describes Jesus and look at the contrast that we see now to Jesus at his second coming to the way we saw him in his earthly first coming 2,000 years ago. Here now he's atop this white horse of victory and in verse 12 it says that his eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. So no longer does he ride on this humble donkey of peace. Now he's on this fiery white charger of war. Right? His eyes aren't filled with tears the way they were when he wept over the city of Jerusalem. Now it says they're full of fire because he sees everything and he judges everything. He's no longer wearing this mocking crown of thorns, but it says he wears many crowns, right? He wears all the crowns, all authority is his. And of course, instead of being stripped as he was by his enemies, now we see him wearing this beautiful garment that's dipped in blood. And that doesn't speak of his own blood that was shed on Calvary. This speaks, just as Isaiah 63 foretold, of Messiah who would come trampling the unrighteous. He says, their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. So his robe this time is stained in the blood of his enemies. There is one specific similarity here in verse 13 that we've seen before. His name is still called the Word of God. It is one of the most familiar and one of the most beautiful names of Jesus in all the scriptures, right? In the very first verse of John's gospel, he says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, he says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, right? In just the same way that it's our words that ultimately reveal our hearts and reveal our minds to others, so the Father reveals himself to us through the Son, the Word who's become flesh, right? Jesus is the greatest communication of the Father. He's the greatest revealer of the Father. He's the, the greatest revealer of, of heaven and the things of the Father that the Father has ever sent. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says, God, who at various times in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the world's who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. So Jesus is the word of God. He is the true revelation of the Father. And I think it's because of that, notice next that John tells us in verse 12 that Jesus has even yet another name. It says that written on him is this name that no one but he himself knows. And that's simply a reminder to us that just like the Father, Jesus is the indescribable one. That our human language and our human finite understanding is incapable of capturing all that he is. Did you know that there are 256 different names given in the Bible for the Lord Jesus? And each one of them, of course, expresses some specific aspect of his character. And then there's this one that catches everything else that those may have missed, right? Because there are parts of the glory of Jesus Christ that are only known to him. And we will spend eternity exploring all of those different nuances of his nature and being astounded by his beauty and astounded by his holiness and astounded and amazed by his love for us. But we're going to do all of that after 
we first follow him and share in this victory. Look what it says in verse 14. It says, And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. So that's us, right? With him. Each of us on our own white heavenly horse, riding with him from heaven. Incidentally, did you know that it's the only in the book of Revelation that we ever see the door of heaven open and we only see it two times? The first time was back in chapter four, verse one, when the door of heaven opened, it said to let the church in after the rapture of the church. And then here in chapter 19, again in verse one, we saw the door opened to let the church out of heaven seven years later as we return with Jesus at his second coming. That's just a fun free fact to throw out for you on a Sunday morning. Verse 15 says that out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. So here's another one of those 256 names. He is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and he's just come as promised in Psalm 2. He is going to come now and he's going to rule, or literally he's going to shepherd the nations with a rod of iron. Because this time when he comes, right, he comes not to bear the wrath of God on the cross. Now he comes to bring the wrath of God down on unrighteousness, to finally crush all of that rebellion against God. Jesus is not always going to strive with man. He is going to put an end to all of this rebellion. And notice that he's going to do it using what? The word of God. The word of God pictured here as this sharp sword that's coming out of his mouth. He will use that, it says, to strike the nations. Now think about that just for a moment. That is heavy. That Jesus will use his word to strike the nations when you consider the fact that it was Jesus whose words spoke the entire world into existence. In Genesis 1.1, Jesus said, let there be light. And what? There was light. His words have power that we cannot even conceive of. Have you ever spoken anything into existence? I didn't think so. Neither have I, right? There is such an incredible gap between God and us. And here he takes his word and he speaks the whole universe into existence. And now that's how powerful his words will be on earth. And now they're going to experience that power of his word, but they are going to experience it in judgment no thank you, right? I do not want to be on the part of the, or the receiving end of any of that. Because the very same power in those very same words said also, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. And he said, and I will give you rest. That's what we want to be a part of. We want to be part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. We do not want to be part of this next supper, which we see now announced by another angel. Look at verse 17. It says, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all of the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great, and I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him, uh, him who sat on the throne and against his army. Now remember before, back in chapter 16, we saw that the devil and the antichrist and the false prophet, they are going to demonically lure all of the great armies of all of the world to come to what will be the final battle of human history, the battle of Armageddon. Here we see that heaven invites 
the scavenger birds to come feed on the bodies which will litter the entire landscape as a result. So we call it the Battle of Armageddon, but from heaven's perspective, it's called the Supper of the Great God. And the guests are the scavenger birds, and the menu is the flesh of men. All of these men, right, all of these armies who have come here to engage in battle for world domination, remember fighting initially against the Antichrist, by this point the Old Testament prophecies tell us that this battle will have been underway for weeks. That there will have been armies battling up and down the Holy Land. Zechariah tells us that on the very day that we return with Jesus, there will be house to house fighting right in the very city of Jerusalem. And as we make our appearance, right, the common enemy of all of these assembled armies will quickly shift from being an enemy of the Antichrist. Now the enemy will be Jesus Christ and us as his armies descending from heaven and they will all unite against us to fight us. But great and small, kings and slaves, they're not going to end up dominating the world. They're not going to conquer the world. They are going to become food for birds who are going to feed on their flesh. Now certainly as you noticed, as we read through this account, that word flesh is sort of uncomfortably repeated five different times in just three verses. We're actually gonna see it a sixth time in the very last verse of our text today. And the point of all of that isn't to be shocking, it's not to be gruesome, but it's to drive home the reality of the fact that as it says in the Psalms, that we are but flesh. At this point in history, the Antichrist and and men and human armies, in their pride and in their arrogance, they are going to become so proud and so deceived, so arrogant, that they are going to completely forget that they are but flesh and that they have no chance of winning against God. You and I have no chance of winning against God. We can't even prevent a common cold from coming into our lives, let alone battle a worldwide virus, right? And yet somehow, sometimes we think that we can take on God in our lives and somehow that we're gonna win. It's crazy, right? It's a deception. We are only flesh. He is the one who is God. And so very quickly we see that this great battle turns out to be a great slaughter and a great supper for these scavenger birds. Even these kings and captains and mighty men, they are no match for the king of kings. Our last two verses say, then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. So the truth of it is that the final phase of this battle isn't really much of a battle at all. Because with a word, all of the enemies of Jesus are defeated. You think about all of their multi-million dollar state-of-the-art weaponry and all of their training, just their sheer numbers, right? The strategy, all of these things are going to be wiped out in one sentence from his mouth. Now, it's interesting, I think, of course, quickly, that everybody else dies in this battle except the Antichrist and the false prophet. They live. They live only to be cast alive into the lake of fire, which we're going to see in chapter 20 is the final permanent place of punishment for all of those who reject Jesus. So today when a believer dies, the Bible says we go directly into the presence of the Lord. When an unbeliever dies, according to what Jesus taught in Luke chapter 16, their spirit goes to a place called Hades, right? The unseen world, kind of the the realm of the dead, as they then wait there for their final sentencing. And the best analogy to understand it is kind of like a convicted criminal who's waiting there in county jail until they can formally be sentenced to go then and serve a life term in state prison. 
in chapter 20, we're going to see that all of Hades, it says, is cast into or it's emptied into the lake of fire. So here, if the Antichrist and the false prophet would have died in this battle, then they would have gone into that waiting place of Hades. And as uncomfortable as that place is, it is not nearly as bad as Gehenna. It's not nearly as bad as this eternal lake of fire. And so these two who had led this final worldwide rebellion against Jesus, these two who've led multiplied million other human souls into destruction with them, they will become the first two participants in this eternal torture as the rest of God's enemies are simply struck down by that sword that proceeded from his mouth. And as we close, I want to remind you that the enemies in your life today are going to be struck down in the very same way. Because look back with me super quickly at verse 14, where John describes us as the armies of heaven, as we ride from heaven with Jesus, it says that the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. So notice, he mentions these wonderful white horses that we're each going to have. He mentions that we are in these beautiful white linens. But what he doesn't mention at all is any kind of any weapon that we are carrying as we ride into this battle. Why? Well, simply because we will not need one. Because it's the Lord Jesus through his word, that is what will defeat our enemies. Not only then, at this incredible scene of his second coming, but it's the very same thing that will defeat our enemies even now today. It's Jesus and his word. And this brings a whole new dimension and a beautiful depth to our understanding when the Bible assures us that the battle does belong to the Lord. This is the ultimate battle, right? All of the armies of earth, the best that man could muster to come against Jesus and his people, and he defeats it with a word. So he will be faithful to fight on your behalf. He will be faithful to keep his promises to you because he is always faithful. He is always true. He's not tied for fourth. He's first. And there is a coming day when we will finally be with him and we will be wed to him and we will get to share with him in this final, glorious, beautiful victory. This is the end of the story, you guys. And guess what? We win. Amen? So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And we thank you for the great encouragement that it brings us, Father. And though these things seem so far away to us, Lord, we know that to you, they are simply the blink of an eye. Lord, they are moments from now. And so we pray, Father, that you would help us to remain faithful, to remain true, Lord, to continue to do those things that will help us to be beautifully adorned as we enjoy this marriage supper of the Lamb. And so we thank you, Lord, and we praise you. And we do it in Jesus' matchless name. And all God's people said, Amen.